folks, this is Krista Soria. Today I'm going to be talking about descriptive statistics with a special focus on determining the centrality of our data. There are multiple ways of understanding data. Um, and to begin, I think it's helpful to distinguish between descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. So descriptive statistics describe large amounts of data in a very short fashion, um, as well as some important characteristics of your data. Whereas inferential statistics, which we're going to be looking at much later in the semester, they go beyond mere description. And the idea is to use the data to draw conclusions and make inferences about a population. There's a number of different types of variables uh, that we normally like to consider. Um, I'm just going to start my slideshow because it'll be a little bit easier to see it. Um, so one, it's important to note that a variable is anything that can be assigned a different value. Um, even something like gender, we can recode in a database to be one is male, two is female, three is transgender, four is gender queer, and so on. ACT scores, of course, we could use. We can recode ethnicity to equal different values. Um, but really, variables are anything that can be assigned different values in a data set. Two types of variables to consider. The first is an independent variable. That's our proposed cause or predictor. Um, this is typically the variable that doesn't necessarily change. In our data file, it's fixed or it's static. And in some cases, this is the, the variable that we would manipulate uh, in an experiment, for example. Um, and then we have dependent variables. And those are dependent upon the independent variables. They're the proposed effect. And I've got cause and effect in quotations because in most correlational data, um, which we use most often in educational research, uh, in most correlational studies, uh, we can't ever determine cause and effect. So we use terms like correlations or relationships or associations. But the dependent variable is the outcome variable. It's something that we measure, but we don't actually manipulate ourselves in an experiment. So an example would be, um, uh, did college students participate in a book club during their first year? Yes or no? And that would be the independent variable. The dependent variable could be uh, whether students' uh, satisfaction with reading increased. And you know, if students were in a book club, we would hope that maybe their satisfaction with, with reading would increase over time. Um, and so that's our dependent variable. We're hoping that the, the, the cause, um, quote unquote, with, of being in a book club would increase student satisfaction with reading. Uh, we've also got different levels of measurement. Um, so there's binary variables, which are two categories. Nominal, which are more than two categories, and they don't necessarily imply any type of logical order. So if I have a category for omnivore, vegetarian, vegan, uh, I, you know, those are not ranked in any particular order. Um, ordinal variables, however, are usually ranked in a logical order, such as cum laude, magna cum laude, and so on. We're primarily going to use uh, binary and nominal variables in this class. Then we also have continuous levels of measurement. So the aforementioned variables were categorical. These are continuous. We've got intervals and ratios. But to be totally honest, these don't matter that much um, in, in our SPSS data set. We're not going to see a lot of differences in these variables, other than to say that sometimes with interval variables, we have to compare. Uh, data like ACT or SAT scores that don't necessarily equal the same thing. So a one point difference in the ACT or a 10 point difference in the ACT, say from a 26 to a 36, is not the same as a 10 point difference in the SAT from a 1300 to a 1310, right? They're very different things. They have different meanings. So they don't have like the same zero point. So sometimes we'll run across those types of issues, but we can certainly talk about that as the semester progresses. Practically speaking, the types of analyses that you use are dependent upon those measurements and the types of measurements. And some analyses are appropriate or inappropriate given your particular set of data. I'm going to skip over measurement error, and we'll talk about that later in the semester. But I want to jump to um, measures of central tendency. And let me, before I do that, let me just quickly describe that descriptive statistics, which is the focus of the start of this class, 
can be grouped into a few different categories. So one is measures of central tendency, the next is measures of dispersion or variation, and finally measures of position. In this uh, video, we're going to be discussing measures of central tendency. Uh, so measures of central tendency describe the central scores in the data. And there's three types of statistics that help us to understand what is the center point of our data. Probably the most commonly used is the mean, and that's the mathematic average. And then we have the median, which when we arrange all of our data in order, it's the very middle, the very middle score or variable. And then finally, the mode, and that's the most frequently occurring score in our data set. And those three have very different implications depending upon our data. And it's really challenging sometimes to answer the question, what's the center point of your data? So if we were to look, for instance, at salaries at the University of Minnesota, let's say that somebody asked the question, what's an average salary at the University of Minnesota? So here we have all the salaries of folks at the University of Minnesota, and we can see that we get very different answers. The mean is 90,000, the median is 40,000, and the mode is 16,000. So to answer with 90,000, which is the mean, might be a little misleading. In reality, the only employee who has a salary of 90,000 or greater is the president. Um, what's happening with the president's salary is that it's pulling all the other smaller data kind of closer to it, and it's pulling the mean closer to it. So that may not be an accurate reflection of the center value of the, the salaries. The median might be closer. That's the very middle value. And the mode may not be the best way either. That reflects those student employees' uh, salaries, um, as you can see, sort of down at the bottom of the list. Um, and so the, the question of what's the center of the data gets a little confusing. It's also challenging to understand when we should remove an outlier. In this case, is the university president's salary an outlier? Or because it naturally exists in the data, should we leave it in the data, right? These are really challenging questions for researchers to answer. So moving forward, suddenly, there we go. All right. Uh, so um, there's a couple of ways to help us detect uh, visually uh, the center of our data. Um, ideally, we are looking to have a normal distribution. And we can see if we have a normal distribution by examining what's called a histogram. Um, and ideally, we want bell-shaped, and we'd like it to be symmetrical around the center, and it looks a little bit like this. We love normal distributions because, effectually, the mean score is the same as the median score, and it's probably also the same as the mode of the data. And that's a really nice and easy way to say, with a high degree of certainty, that that is our center, right? So whatever that might be, in this case, let's say it's 10. OK, 10 is our center because it's our median, it's our mean, and it also happens to be our mode. And that's most likely to happen under our normal distribution. Uh, the area under this curve we refer to as equaling 1 or 100%. So put that in your pocket for later, because we're going to use it in a different uh, lecture. But remember that the area under the curve equals about 100%. So there are some uh, ways of kind of analyzing your data to see whether or not we have a normal distribution. Before I talk a little bit about skew and kurtosis, I want to actually examine some of our data. So let's do that. Um, I'm going to pull up the thriving data, so follow along with me if you can. And I changed Q22 underscore 1 to a nominal data, but I want to change it back to scale. Because um, that way, SPSS will know for us that, yes, we're dealing with numbers. So in order to understand the data a little bit more, I'm going to click on Analyze, and then Descriptive Statistics, and then Explore. And there's uh, two ways of pulling over our data. Um, so one, oh, I just lost where it was. There we go. Uh, I feel as though I'm learning things in my classes that are worthwhile to me as a person. Um, one is that you can just grab it and drop it. The other one is that you can highlight it and move it over. A couple of things before I finish this uh, 
that calling my data um, is I want to point out this screen has a lot of different functions. In this left hand box, um, first you can expand it to make it a little bit easier or minimize it to make it easier to see. Second, if you right click in the box, you can sort the file alphabetically and sometimes that's really nice to help you quickly find a variable. You can also uh, sort, um, I'm going back to file order here, you can also sort by displaying the variable names. So and again the variable names correspond to this very left hand column over here. Um, or, or the labels and so either one um, and again you can sort it alphabetically if you like but I'm just going to keep the labels and file order because I know where this variable is located pretty pretty easily. Um, if you click on statistics everything here is just fine so we'll do continue but for plots I want to make sure that I have both a stem and leaf plot and a histogram selected and then I click continue and down here you'll see that in the display both statistics and plots will show up and then I'm going to go ahead and click uh, OK. Uh, one thing to mention too before I forget is um, the, the data, the way that they're ordered might change for you. So I don't have any identifiers here for students. Um, in other words, uh, if I were to type in student one, and I were to sort the data any other way, student one is no longer going to be student one. In fact, that student disappeared somewhere to the bottom of my data. Um, and that's perfectly fine. Um, your student one is not going to be the same as my student one. Your student four is probably not going to be the same as my student four. It's perfectly fine. It doesn't really matter. What might matter though is uh, as you're looking at your data, sometimes students will accidentally sort this <laughs> um, and that can get a little confusing uh, when it comes to working together as a class. Um, sometimes I will add variables in and that will change the order, but uh, we can always sort of refer to the variable name and the label to help us sort of stay centered and grounded no matter where it lies in our data set. So I was reminded of that when I was opening up my Explore tab uh, on the left-hand side. That might change, and that's okay. Um, but it might make it a little bit harder or easier to follow along. So just be a little cautious there about what changes you make here. Okay, so our output. So first in our output, we get our mean value, 4.74, compared to our median, which is 5. We get a little bit more information about our variance and standard deviation, and we'll talk about those in our next lecture on measures of dispersion. Um, if we scroll down, so we first looked at histograms, we first talked about histograms. One thing that I like to do is double click on the histogram, and here we have a little uh, option that says show distribution curve. I like to click on it because um, it highlights what might be a normal curve and behind it I'm just going to click back on it so we have it on our screen. Uh, so as you can see if we were to compare this to our normal distribution it doesn't look very normal does it? Uh, for one there's all these data over here on the left hand side for another there's none of those data on the right hand side. Practically speaking um, this isn't bad to receive, <laughs> in other words, um, I feel as though I'm learning things in my classes that are worthwhile to me as a person. Um, a lot of students said that they agreed, which is five, and a lot more, you know, also said that they strongly agreed, which is six. I want more of my students to answer four, five, or six compared to one, two, or three, right? So the fact that this isn't normally distributed doesn't indicate necessarily a problem with the data. It's not like a big emergency, right? In fact, it's great that we have more students who agree that they're learning things in their classes that are worthwhile to them. Um, but what is challenging is it gets hard to figure out what is our center value. Um, and if we go back under descriptives, that's complicated further by the fact that our mean is different from our median, right? So that's a little challenging. 
There are some additional diagnostics that we can look at as well to help us understand uh, what might be the center or the mean of our data and to see if we've got some potential problems um, with how our data might look. So for instance, um, I was mentioning the skew and the kurtosis. So the skew of the data is the symmetry of the distribution. Positive skew, the scores are kind of bunched at lower values. Negative skews, the scores are bunched at higher values. And then we also have kurtosis, which refers to the heaviness of the tails. But I like to think of it as um, leptokurtic is like really tall, like a building, and platykurtic is kind of flat. So here's some examples of skews. So uh, this one right here on the left, um, even though it says skew right, it's on the left-hand side of your screen. That's a positive skew, also known as it's skewed right. And that's because in the data, the, the skew is on the right-hand side. And then the same with the skewed left, the skew is on the left-hand side. That's called a negative skew, because that skew is in the negative. Um, if we're to think of this as an x-axis, the score might, the scale might go from 1 to 100, and so the skew is on the negative side, the lower end of things. In a positive or right skew, what we tend to find is that the median is much higher than, I'm sorry, the mean is much higher than the median, and that's because these extreme values over here are dragging out um, our mean, sort of like what happened with the president's salary. And in a negative skew, the mean tends to be lower than the median. In kurtosis, as I mentioned, leptokurtic looks a little bit like a, a tower. So you can see the data are very closely packed around the mean versus platykurtic. And in platykurtic, we have much greater standard deviations, which again, we'll talk about in measures of dispersion or variation. There's a lot more variation happening in the platykurtic data. And you can see the platykurtic looks like a little platypus, which is why it's called platykurtic. Um, we also get some additional information from our output, and one is that we get a stem and leaf plot, and this is essentially um, a histogram tilted on its side, and then we also get a box plot. And the way that box plots work is they describe um, not the, medi the mean of the data, but instead the median of the data. So here we get a 50th percentile, which is essentially our median. And then we get the bounds of the 75th and the 25th percentile. So this is our interquartile range right here. Um, and then we also have um, some indications of extreme scores or outliers. And I think that that's how box plots are the most useful to us. So if we look at our box plot, we do see some of those outliers, right? They're showing up for us. Um, and what's really nice about the way that this looks in SPSS is it tells us where those outliers are at in our data so we can go and investigate them. So for instance, one of those values is 920. So if I'm going back to Q22 underscore 1, I'm going to go look at student 920. And uh, let's see, sure enough, oh, was that the right one? Also, I'm learning things in my classes. I may have read that incorrectly. Um, I don't think that's right. Um, oh, I sorted my data. Huh, that's why. Let me do it again. <laughs> this is another good reason why, why sometimes sorting your data can be problematic. So let me run it again. Same thing. I, I remember I sorted my data, <laughs> so just so you could see what it looked like in ascending or descending. Okay, now if I go to student 909, that student should have a pretty low score, probably a 2. 909, where are you at? All right, so 2. Um, and so that student is, um, according to the box plot, somewhat of an outlier. Uh, you may want to ask yourself, is that student really an outlier, an outlier, or is that just really existing in the data? Sometimes outliers are um, their mistakes in the data entry, or sometimes they're natural, or sometimes they're unnatural. Uh, it, one, for instance, for example, that I had is I looked at students' use of academic libraries in their first year, and I found that one student had checked out like a thousand journal articles in his or her first year compared to uh, students um, on average who had like seven. <laughs> and so um, we took that student out of the data set and we surmised that the student 
was probably working as a research assistant for a professor. So we took that student out because we thought that's not really representative of like a true first year student's use of data. Um, but in this case, you may want to leave it in because a two is, is a part of the data and the scale is only from one to six. Now, if that student was a 22, that's a mistake, right? Because the scale goes from one to six. So the box plots are really useful for that particular reason. Additionally, we have some other diagnostics that can help us to see beyond visually whether we might have um, a problem with skew or kurtosis. So if I were to go back to my histogram, it looks a little bit, um, and let me just add in my handy dandy normal distribution curve, here we go. It looks to me um, like with all this drag over here in the negative zone, um, and this slight tilt over here, it looks like to me that it's probably going to be a negative skew. Um, that's just kind of eyeballing it, right? It looks a little bit like this. So is that really accurate or is it just my eyes? Um, so one, we knew that the mean was 4.74 compared to the median, which is 5. And, you know, when the mean is smaller than the median, that typically happens in negative or less skew. So that's, you know, an indication. But additionally, we have some statistics to help us out. So if a, a set of data, a distribution is negatively skewed, it's less than negative 0.40. So going back up to our descriptives, our skew, oh, where'd it go, is negative 0.883. So yeah, that's less than negative 0.40. So it's definitely negatively skewed. And let's start, check out that kurtosis. So if I remember, it seemed like it was pretty tall, right? Not very flat, not a lot of wide distributions across the, the spectrum from one to six, but it seemed pretty tall. So is it leptokurtic? Uh, if it's peaked or leptokurtic, it would be higher than 0.4. And in our diagnostics under descriptives, yep, kurtosis is 1.85. So yes, that's high. And that means it's a little leptokurtic. Uh, so that's just helpful to us to understand whether or not we're dealing with a normal distribution. Um, we also might encounter occasionally bimodal or multimodal distributions. Even though it looks like two normal distributions or three right in a row, that these are non-normal distributions. Why do we care about things like normal distributions and skew and kurtosis? Well, one, if our data are not quote unquote normally distributed, we need to take this into account in our statistical analysis. Sometimes what we have discovered is that skew and kurtosis are really influenced by high sample sizes. So if you have a large sample, you're probably going to get a skew or kurtosis negative or less than 0.40. Um, so it's probably just bound to happen. Um, so in, in many, many cases, it's not that big of a problem. but Having non-normally distributed data can help us to better interpret what measures of central tendency we should report. So in other words, what's better, the mean, the median, or the mode? And then finally, all these tests really help us to discover if we have outliers in the data that we need to address that perhaps we need to remove um, or we need to uh, investigate the cause of why something was typed in error. So I hope that helps a little bit with understanding some of those measures of dispersion, I'm sorry, the measures of central tendency um, as you're analyzing your data. Um, as always, please let me know if you have questions.